Hi folks, I'm Susan Young, the Outreach Coordinator at the Shiloh Museum of Ozark History. Today I'd like to spend a few minutes sharing with you some information on a local history topic that was part of a nationwide movement. As you probably know, 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the 19th, the passage of the 19th Amendment guaranteeing women in the United States the right to vote. Um, what was going on on the local level, what was going on in Northwest Arkansas is part of that movement. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a very specific slice of local history to do with women's suffrage in this program entitled Phone 584, if you are a suffragist, the founding of Fayetteville's Political Equality League. Now, I'm going to turn myself off. This little picture of me in the corner is gonna go away for a couple of reasons, because uh, one, I've discovered that when I'm trying to record programs talking to a computer screen, I tend to fidget a lot, and I don't want y'all to have to look at that for the next few minutes. And also, I don't want to block any photographs or credit lines or any type of information that, that might be on the slide. So for right now, I'm going to disappear, but you stay tuned. The information I'm going to share with you all comes from clues that I found in this unassuming little bit of ephemera, this tiny little booklet that is one of the many, many, many treasures to be found in the Special Collections Department of Mullins Library at the University of Arkansas. It's the first yearbook for the Fayetteville Political Equality League, a women's suffrage organization that was founded in 1914. So everything I'm gonna share with you started here, started with this tiny little booklet. Now, before I go any further, let me make a couple of explanations here. The woman that you saw on the first slide that I showed, my introductory slide, I'm sorry to say she's not an Arkansas resident, an Arkansaier. She is a suffragist and she is from our neighboring state of Missouri. Her name is Genevieve Clark, and she was a, a well-known suffragist from Missouri. Her father was a well-known politician, Champ Clark. But when I found this photo at the Library of Congress, it seemed perfect, a perfect fit for the subject of my talk, Phone 584, if you are a suffragist. So a nod to Genevieve Clark and the work she did in Missouri for women's suffrage, and she's made it to a discussion on a the Arkansas, a bit of the Arkansas women's suffrage movement. Now, what is the difference between a suffragette and a suffragist? Well, what they share in common is they were both terms for women who were fighting to gain the right to vote. In the term of suffragist, that could be used for men that were helping to gain women the right to vote. The term suffragette uh, had a lot of baggage with it. It was coined in 1906 by the British press to mock women in the suffrage movement there. The, the movement, however, the women there in Britain embraced the term and it went on to be associated with the militant factions of suffragists. Um, in the United States, the term suffragette was not embraced because cause I think of the, the violent nature that people associated with the actions of suffragettes in Britain. Suffragist is the term that, uh, that you'll see quite often in, in references to the movement in the United States. So on the left, these are both pictures of suffragists in America. The women on the left could arguably be called suffragettes because they are getting ready to go to jail. They're not violent, they are peacefully protesting, but what they're getting ready to be arrested for is their refusal to put down those banners. The police had instructed them to put down their banners and stop this protest, and these women refused in Washington, D.C. So they are getting ready to be arrested by that woman in the middle, and um, taken to jail and women in the United States did go to jail for their fight in, in the cause to gain a vote, the vote for women. Women on the right 
I don't think would be called suffragettes in the violent sense of the, na of the word. They are women in Illinois that are counting petition signatures uh, to get the amendment brought before the, their legislature. So suffragette, suffragist, both are women who are working to get the right to vote. They're going about it in different ways. Perhaps that's the best way to, to talk about that. This image was the centerfold in February 1915's issue of Puck Magazine, a nationwide publication. It's called The Awakening, and it's a good description, visual description, I think, of what was going on in the United States in the early 1900s. Women had been advocating for the right to vote in this country since the mid-1800s. Efforts expanded after 1900 women got really, really serious about gaining the right to vote. And so what you see in this, in this image, by 1915, all those states in the West that you see in white here, that Lady Liberty is, is walking over, those states had already granted women full suffrage, full rights to vote in all elections. Everywhere else in the country, you see women clamoring for that same right for, for the temperance movement, which was uh, a, a big cause in the nation at this time, women's suffrage was seen as a way to achieve prohibition. So you have a lot of people in the temperance movement, women mostly and men, that, that saw gaining the right to vote for women as a way to, to pass prohibition. Needless to say, the liquor lobby was strongly against women's suffrage for this reason. Throughout, I need to point out here, throughout the decades of the suffrage movement, it is important to remember that black women in America were sidelined from this mainstream movement once it became evident to the leaders of the women's suffrage movement that alienating white women and alienating supporters in the South was something they could not afford. So for black women, the struggle was twofold. Not only were you a woman trying to gain the vote, you're a black woman trying to gain the vote. And for all people of color, the uh, road, the struggle to gain voting rights was long and still is a struggle today. So what was going on in Arkansas about the time of that illustration that centerfold in Puck magazine. Well, here is the timeline of, of major events as far as our state legislation towards suffrage. Prior to 1920, 20 U.S. states and territories had given, right to women, given women the right to vote. Arkansas was not one of those 20 states. So in 1911 is when it starts. That's the first constitutional amendment for women's suffrage that is brought to the House in Arkansas. It's proposed to the legislature. The amendment passed in the Senate but failed in the House. In 1915, a women's suffrage amendment to the Constitution was again brought before the Arkansas legislature. The 1915 amendment was accepted by both the House and the Senate but ultimately failed to go on to a vote due to a legal technicality. Then in 1917, the state passed a law permitting women to vote in party primary elections, making Arkansas the first non-suffrage state in the union to permit women to vote in primaries. So as of 1917, a woman can vote in the primary election, but that's it. Then in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution becomes law and prohibits any U.S. citizen from being denied the right to vote on the basis of sex. So Arkansas was behind the game compared to some states, ahead of the game compared to some other states. Um, in researching those 1911 and 1915 amendment debates, I ran across a couple of just remarkable comments made by Washington County legislators that I would like to share with you.
During the 1915 amendment debate, State Senator Iveson Burgess of Pope County stated that again, rural women would not vote. So they're still, they're still raising that specter. He also said, Iverson Burgess also said that the bill would quote, turn the Negro woman loose to vote and more of them will vote than white women. To which Senator Benjamin Greathouse of Washington County assured, reassured Senator Burgess of Pope County by saying this, Senator Greathouse on the issue of black women voting said this, quote, the Anglo-Saxon has always taken care of its problems and will take care of the Negro question as well. Well, certainly these elected officials, while they were elected to represent their constituents, they did not speak for everyone in Washington County, especially not everyone in Fayetteville. As is evidenced by this simple little booklet, this Fayetteville Political Equality, Equality League booklet. This is a glimpse, this little booklet is a window into the fight for women's suffrage on a very local level. So what can we learn from this little handmade booklet about the women's suffrage movement in Fayetteville? Well, we know that on April 23rd, 1914, the Fayetteville Daily Democrat newspaper ran a front page story, front page above the fold, announcing that a national suffrage day rally would be held on May 2nd in Fayetteville at University Chapel, which is today we know that as Giffel's Auditorium in Old Main. This woman, Lessie Stringfellow Reed, arguably in my mind is, is the founder of the Fayetteville Political Equality League. She was the local organizer for this May 2nd rally, which was part of a nationwide movement. On May 2nd, women all across the country held rallies with the goal of getting the attention of their legislators. They wanted passage of an Equal Rights Amendment. So this May 2nd rally was, was a groundswell of uh, women suffrage suffragists. Lessie Stringfellow Reed was a journalist. She was also the society page editor for the Fayetteville Daily Democrat. So at the top of her society page column, she always had her phone number, phone 584. And in her column about the uh, Suffrage Day rally on May 2nd, she wrote this. She encouraged everyone to attend the suffrage, attend it in person. But if you couldn't, to phone your support, phone 584. She said, are you a suffragist? Phone in your name to 584. Reed promised that supporters' names would not be published in any newspaper or in any publication without permission. So, as she said, quote, so the more timid folk who on the quiet resent taxation without representation, but who are backward about coming forward, need not fear being published as suffragettes, that horrible term, that suggests brickbats and hunger strikes. So you see there is, is an indication right there that Lessie Stringfellow Reed is defining that term suffragette as, as something that most suffragists, mainstream suffragists wanted to steer clear of. So on Saturday, May 2nd, 1914, some 40 people gathered in University Chapel, there's Old Main. And that this photo is just a, a photo I chose because it's of the time period, very close to the time period of that 1914 May meeting. Those are cadets, university students, male cadets. They're not the army being called out to, to tamp down the suffragist meeting by any, by any means. It's totally unrelated to the suffragist movement. But if you can imagine, there's Old Main, about 1914, in Giffel's Auditorium, what was then known as University Chapel, there is a meeting, a suffrage day rally. And some 40 people attended and heard the following resolution, which was drafted 
by Fayetteville attorney Alan Flowers. I'm going to read the resolution in full. Whereas there are 6 million working women in America who have no voice in the framing of our laws and in the administration of same, and whereas thousands of women in the United States own property and pay taxes but have no voice in our government, and whereas the women of the country have charge of the homes and the rearing of our children, the future citizens of this great country, and whereas the women of Australia, New Zealand, Norway, Finland, Zurich, Switzerland, Portugal, Honduras, and other countries are accorded the full privileges of citizenship, we, the undersigned citizens of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and students of the University of Arkansas are persuaded that the women of the United States should be accorded the full privileges of citizenship, namely the right to vote in all elections, the right to participate in all affairs of government, the right to assist in the making of all laws. We therefore respectfully request our representatives in our state legislature and national Congress to use all reasonable means to have such laws enacted as will give to the women of the state of Arkansas and the United States of America the right to vote in all elections and the further right to participate in all affairs of government. That resolution was endorsed by 84 prominent, I'm quoting from the newspaper, prominent men and women of Fayetteville and was approved heartily by all 40 people in attendance at University Chapel on that meeting uh, on May 2nd, 1914. At that May 2nd meeting, Reverend Nathan Ragland gave the invocation. Reverend Ragland was a well-known minister, a much-loved minister at uh, Fayetteville's First Christian Church. He went on to become the chaplain for the Fayetteville Political Equality League and was a vocal supporter of the, su of the suffrage movement. The, uh, the meeting, according to the newspaper, the, the meeting in University Hall, quote, was very informal and adjourned rather hastily on account of a threatening thunderstorm. So the, the people got in and got out after they passed that resolution. And from that May 2nd rally, the Fayetteville Political Equality League was born. First page of this little booklet says that its motto, the motto of the organization is equal rights to all. Their colors were yellow and black. Their flower was the sunflower. And their meetings were to be held on the fourth Tuesday of the month in various members' homes. They rotated around in the meeting place. Here are the founding officers as listed in this little booklet. And I don't have pictures of very many of them. And I've scrounged around trying to find some information on, on this, these officers and also the early members and supporters and guest speakers. Everyone that's mentioned in this booklet, I've tried to come up with some tidbit of information when I could that gives us some insight into, into, their, into what makes them tick. Um, so Elizabeth Palmer, the president, her husband was a lawyer and fruit farmer. Let me also say that I get a little discouraged. Most all, all these women, unless they were single, even in this booklet of the Political Equality Club, or Political Equality League, that's a mistake on my, on my slide. Um, all these women were listed by their husband's names. So rather than Mrs. Lessie Stringfellow Reed, she was listed as Mrs. James Reed. So the quest becomes how to track down these women. What were their names? What were their names? They had a name. Elizabeth Palmer. And, and most, many times, what, what I'm getting at is many times what I could find out about them was not so much about them as it was about their husband. Um, Elizabeth Palmer's husband was a lawyer and a fruit farmer. They came to northwest Arkansas from Iowa to escape cold winters and for the better growing season in northwest Arkansas. They lived in Fayetteville but also owned a summer, summer cabin in Winslow. They left Fayetteville when... Mr. Palmer took a job with the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. 
Martha Hudson White, the vice president, was a U of A drama instructor. She was also president of the Mildred Lee chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1914 and 1915. So the same year that Martha Hudson White is serving as vice president of the Fayetteville Political Equality League, she is also president of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And of course, my immediate thought is, what did Martha Hudson White think about giving black women the vote? I can't presume to know, but I would presume to guess, to make a guess that she would not have been supportive of giving black women the right to vote. Mary Eleanor Drake was the wife of Noah Drake, a uh, geologist, a professor at the University of Arkansas. She and Noah Drake met when they were both in China. She was a Methodist missionary and he was on a geology exped expedition in China. She also, she rose high in the state level of uh, women's suffrage groups. She was the on the executive board of the Arkansas Women's Suffrage Association. Madge Morrow, one of the few women listed in this booklet and uh, associated with the Fayetteville Political Equality League that was actually a Northwest Arkansas native. Many, many of these women were people that moved here because their husbands were at the university or because their husbands had, had jo job, their job had brought them here. Um, but Madge Morrow was actually a native of Cane Hill. She was a University of Arkansas graduate and she served later as president of the Political Equality League. She died young, fairly young. She died, I believe, in the 19, late 1920s or 1930s, and her obituary described her as a student of social and political economy. Also, Madge Morrow was the first chairman of Fayetteville's League of Women Voters, which was founded in 1920 and birthed from the Fayetteville Political Equality League. Eunice Oates, the recording secretary, was a music teacher, a musician, and a writer. And in 1918, she went to Texas A&M to teach wireless telegraphy to male students who were hoping to enlist in the Signal Corps at Texas A&M. Naomi Williams, the treasurer of the organization, was a high school teacher of Latin and English. He was very involved with the local Women's Christian Temperance Union. She taught Sunday school at the Methodist Church and she helped organize the first Girl Scout Council in Fayetteville in 1920. We've already met Lessie Stringfellow Reed, the journalist who went on to, she did go on to become the editor of the Fayetteville Daily Democrat, which was the forerunner of the Northwest Arkansas Times. She and Times publisher Roberta Fulbright were, um, were very close friends. And Reverend Nathan Ragland, we've met him, who was the chaplain for the Fayetteville Political Equality League. So of all those people I just mentioned, all the officers, these are the ones that I've been able to find a picture for. There's Mary Eleanor Drake, the uh, Methodist missionary who met her husband in China and moved to Fayetteville where he was at the University of Arkansas and where she also served on the state level with the Arkansas Women's Suffrage Association. This is Mar Martha Hudson White, the woman who was a U of A drama instructor and also the UDC president, United Daughters of the Confederacy president. And we've already met Reverend Ragland, but there he is again. And we've met Lessie Stringfellow Reed. So of all those officers, we have images of four of them. And I, I love including images whenever I'm doing programs, even if they're not very great quality images, because I just think it helps a lot toward connecting with these people in history to see their photograph. Now, I've only been able to, re to find photos of a few of the members that are that are noted as being members of the organization. One is uh, this couple, 
Dr. Morgan and Dr. Teresa Jennings. He was a gynecologist. She was a pediatrician. So obviously women's issues were at the forefront for them. They moved to Washington County from Illinois in 1911 due to Dr. Morgan Jennings' health. They lived out near Sons Chapel where they owned a fruit farm. Now here's some, an interesting tidbit about Dr. Teresa Jennings that happened to her when she was in medical school in Chicago. So this happened before she came to Arkansas, but, but clearly I think would certainly, certainly does give us some insight into her struggle for women's rights. When she was in medical school in Chicago, she was not welcomed by some of her male colleagues. She went to her room one night, opened up her dresser drawer only to find human intestines there in the drawer. Another night she came back to her room and found a human cadaver on her bed. She went on to become valedictorian of her class, of her medical school class. Dr. Doctors Jennings did not stay in Northwest Arkansas too long. They returned to Illinois about 1918, but kept ownership of their fruit farm at least into the 1930s and came back to visit um, at least a few times after they left, after they went back to Illinois. Dr. John Height was a Tennessee native who lived in Madison County, Arkansas. He was there by 1880 as a physician, but he retired to Fayetteville about 1905. Dr. Height, from his youth, was a believer in women's suffrage. In his obituary, when he passed away, it was noted that when primary suffrage was granted to women in Arkansas, so in 1917, Dr. Height offered to pay the poll tax of every woman registered and did pay the poll tax of more than 100 women who registered to vote. Isabel McCartney, this is her picture in the 1910 University of Arkansas annual, but she was out of college and about 26 years old when the Fayetteville Political Equality League was formed. But I love this quote about her in the 1910 U of A yearbook. This is what a quote from her, from Isabel McCartney. I'm not denying that the women are foolish. God Almighty made them so, so as to match the men. So uh, she sounds like a real pistol. In her widowed years, she was house mother for the Kappa Alpha fraternity at the University of Arkansas. She was also a, an alumni of the Chi Omega Greek sorority or women's fraternity. And there were several what, was, what were labeled university girls listed as supporters of that, one of the, some of the 80 supporters of the original meeting and on May 2nd, 1914, the original call to support women's suffrage. And among those university students, women students, I was able to find pictures and a little bit of information about some of them. Elizabeth Adams was the, was the first woman to serve as editor of the university's student newspaper, the first woman editor. Nell Byrd was editor of the university journal called the Arkansan. And Gladys Funk of Rogers, I could find out no information from her, from her yearbook that would, she was a German major, um, but no information that really gave me any clues about her, her thoughts on suffrage, other than obviously she's a supporter. She was one of the first to sign on as, as a supporter of the Political Equality League. And Essie Hollabaugh, Besta Kilgore, and Louise Morehouse. Again, all University of Arkansas women students among those who were the earliest supporters of the suffrage, of the organized suffrage movement in Fayetteville. As I said, each month, the Political Equality League would meet in Fayetteville at a different member's home, and they always had a guest speaker 
that would come and talk. Um, Lessie Stringfellow Reed was very good about making sure there were notices in the newspaper about the upcoming meetings. As you can imagine, it was a great help to the league to have uh, a journalist, a newspaper reporter on your board and an active member. And Lessie Stringfellow Reed once wrote as she was uh, notifying the public about a meeting, she said, all who have friends who are interested in or prejudiced against suffrage are invited to bring someone to the next meeting. Both kinds are needed in the league, the former as assistants, the latter as converts. Certainly, he was not a convert. He was a supporter and the only guest speaker in that 1914-1915 league yearbook that I could find a photo of in our museum collection. He was Julian Waterman, a professor of U of A economics, of economics at the U of A. He later went on to get a law degree and became the first dean of the law school at the university. He was one of those original 80 supporters of the Fayetteville Political Equality League. His guest talk, his talk for the, the monthly meeting was, for a monthly meeting of the league, was on political equality from an economic viewpoint. So he's speaking from his role as an economist, not as an attorney. He stated, he told the women at this meeting that industrializ industrialization has led men away from self-sufficient home labor to take on the role of world producer. Men make laws to protect their pocketbooks. Women, meanwhile, Waterman said, have retained the viewpoint of the individual consumer. The loss of that viewpoint in lawmaking, Waterman argued, had led to child labor and unregulated food processing. So in his mind, giving women the right to vote was, was going to be a, uh, a great boon toward relieving social ills such as child labor and impure food, not, not having the food laws, food, food regulations that we needed. Now, for the rest of the speakers that I want to tell you about, I have no photo of them, so I'm going to take you back to the, the little booklet, the little yearbook of the Fayetteville Political Equality League, and all these speakers are listed in there. Reverend Marion Nelson Waldrop was a Eureka Springs native, or I'm sorry, Elm Springs native. He was pastor of the Fayetteville Methodist Church. He was known as a very eloquent speaker. He traveled all over the state of Arkansas and indeed in the Midwest on uh, speaking engagements. He was very active statewide in the anti-saloon movement. So he was for prohibition. So you see why he would encourage the vote for women because it was clearly believed by many, by most people that if you give women the right to vote, they will stamp out these, these, uh, these saloons and, and liquor. They, we will have prohibition if women get the right to vote. He spoke, Reverend Waldrop spoke on why Arkansas needs equal suffrage. He noted that where women vote, their interest is ever on the side of morality. Mothers are interested in securing for their boys and girls laws that will protect them from illicit industries and vicious temptations, Waldrop said. He went on to say that the men of this state have made about as bad a mess of the government as is possible and that the women couldn't do any worse and would probably do much better. Attorney Alan Flowers, the man who, the lawyer who penned that resolution at the May 2nd, 1914 rally, spoke one month to the league on the home and the state. He pointed out that there is no legal nor sensible reason why a single right of citizenship should be denied to women. That woman is called upon to meet every obligation that men are called upon to meet, except shouldering a gun, and that in the case of battle, she nevertheless is called upon to serve on the battlefield in caring for the injured and the dead, a more heroic service than that of killing and maiming. Martin Luther Root was a Fayetteville farmer. He was originally from New York, and I think of all the guest speakers and their programs listed this is the one that I wish I could have been there to hear. His talk 
was entitled, If I Were a Woman. Martin Luther Root, Fayetteville Farmer. If I were a woman, he said, I would read my Bible. He urged women to use reason and intelligence in interpreting Bible history, using good judgment and what to take as historic and what to take as the opinion voiced by priests in days gone by. This is stunning to me as someone that was raised in a very conservative little country church to hear a man in 1914, 1915 Fayetteville with this kind of enlightened view of the Bible really is, is striking to me. And he went on to note that uh, women in the Bible, that those, those writings that were done by the priests in days gone by were used to fit conditions as they were in their day and in St. Paul's day. And this has done much to keep women subjugated throughout the ages. The newspaper article, I'm sure, was written by Leslie Stringfellow Reed uh, detailing Mr. Root's program noted, frequent applause interrupted the speaker. I bet, I bet it did. Reverend Marvin Gillespie was a Presbyterian minister in Fayetteville. You see, th there's so many men of the cloth that were backing the women's suffrage movement in Fayetteville. Reverend Marvin Gillespie, a Presbyterian minister in town, focused his talk, his monthly talk, on the idea that government should be motivated by service to others rather than self-interest. He urged the League to study the radical teachings of Jesus, who, he said, quoting, who repudiated self-interest, made service the standard of life, and loved the motive of service. Into our politics and social programs as well, there must come the radicalism of Jesus, or there can be no solution to our social problems. Reverend Gillespie also pointed to Abraham Lincoln, saying that Lincoln's pronouncement of, quote, a government of the people, for the people, and by the people must not be changed into a government of the people by the rascals for the rich. The great danger of democracy everywhere is the selfishness of the hearts of men and women. I am concerned not so much about who or how many are given the ballot as about the moral character of the people which the ballot represents. Reverend Gillespie went on to say that unless all the signs of the times are misleading, equal suffrage to both sexes will be universal in the country in a few years. And he was right to an extent. Arkansas women and indeed women across the country persisted. We were persisting even back then. Um, persisted in this quest to gain the right to vote. As is seen in this photo or this drawing that was done for an August 1919 edition of Suffragist newspaper. That was the name of the newspaper, a nationwide publication. It shows women from Arkansas, Nebraska and Montana proudly adding their state stars to the ratification banner while that poor woman in the background from Georgia mourns her state's rejection of ratification. So Arkansas certainly didn't lead the pack, but we weren't at the tail end of things either. Um, as stated before, in 1917, Arkansas women were granted the right to vote in primary elections. In 1919, Arkansas became the 12th state in the nation to ratify the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And in 1920, finally, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution becomes law and prohibits any citizen from being, any U.S. citizen from being denied the right to vote on the basis of sex. Now, I say that Reverend Gillespie was right to an extent in his prediction that equal suffrage to both sexes would soon be universal in the country because even with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, for people of color, the fight was far from over. Poll taxes, literacy tests, outright violence enacted by the white power structure kept black men and black women disenfranchised until the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act 
which outlawed discriminatory voting practices. So for people of color, the, the road still was long and still was hard and still had a ways to go. And voter suppression still plagues our nation today. You can't listen to the news or read a newspaper without that understanding. So the work for democracy continues. To those who came before us, who fought for voting rights, they believed that a person's vote mattered. And those who still fight for voting rights today, they believe a person's vote matters. I believe that a person's vote matters. I hope you believe that too. So with the tip of the hat to the Fayetteville Political Equality League, I encourage you to exercise your right to vote and to keep us moving forward in this work for democracy. Appreciate y'all listening. If you have any questions or comments, you're, feel free to email me. Um, this is Susan Young again at Shiloh Museum of Ozark History. My email is syoung at springdellar.gov. Um, visit our website, shilohmuseum.org, and y'all come see us when you can. Thanks again for listening.